Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. Today we have built a vessel which is hopefully able to grab hold of an asteroid and bring it in to land at Kerbin. Now, uh, we have actually got a fairly simplistic sort of booster attached to this thing. Obviously the main component here is the payload. Uh, the booster itself though has got uh, four solid rocket boosters just on the sides there, which are just going to help give it that little more thrust of weight. The entire payload up the top there is, of course, covered by a massive fairing. And I've actually uh, played around with this fairing a little uh, just to make it look interesting, frankly. It's uh, it's it's kind of cool looking. It's probably terrible for drag, but hey, uh, yeah, let's, let's give this thing a go. It's kind of cool looking. I kind of love how it just fans out like that too. That's really cool. Those of you that saw the Asteroid Capture, Redirect and Mining mission from uh, a few weeks ago, I think it was number 37, um, might recall that we left Asteris up here orbiting uh, with our very nice mining vessel. If you want to check that out, uh, I've got a link here. Now, of course, the first thing we're doing here is selecting our Asteroid Redirector vessel uh, from our tracking station. We'll head up there. And here is Astra still waiting patiently. We left her up here with absolutely no uh, no way to return. The vessel had no method of uh, re-entering back into Kerbin. Now the first thing we just did there was just top ourselves up. We did a little mining there on the asteroid and refilled ourselves. And what we want to do here now is just zero out our inclination uh, relative to the moon. So we've selected the moon here as the target. We're going to uh, to wipe off our inclination difference. This is going to allow us to re-enter along the equatorial plane. And with any luck, we'll be able to land uh, quite close to the Kerbal Space Center. So there we go there. We have got a nice zeroed out inclination compared to the equatorial plane. What we'll do now is head back to the space center and off we launch here now. This vessel has got absolutely no Kerbals aboard. Uh, there is only one little seat at the top of this thing and that is to bring Astra's back home. Uh, hopefully safely. We'll see how we go with that. More importantly though, for the future of all Kerbal kind, we want to bring that magic asteroid back home and uh, test it. We want to see what is inside that thing, what makes it glow that mysterious purple colour. Is it something dangerous? Is it something mysterious? We have got no idea at this point in time. We have of course already started our gravity turn coming up here to ditch our solid rocket boosters there. And there they go. Now, so we don't need to worry too much about space junk. We are actually launching this thing quite high. The idea is to keep our periapsis below zero kilometers. That means that uh, our first stage is going to fall harmlessly back into Kerbin's atmosphere. Now, we are launching quite high. This isn't quite as efficient, obviously, but uh, for the purpose of this episode, we actually did want to get out of the atmosphere quite quickly so that this thing didn't have too much drag. It's got a massive fairing on it. And uh, yeah, we are basically heading right up into a very high orbit to intercept with our asteroids. So there's no reason why we can't uh, do a massive burn here at the start and ditch this first stage. So as our main fuel tanks run out here shortly, you'll see we end up with an apoapsis well above 5,000 kilometers and our periapsis still sitting uh, just slightly less than zero kilometers. So we're going to be able to clean all this up very nicely. Now that that first stage has depleted, we're going to ditch that first stage there. And then of course we're going to ditch those fairings in quite a spectacular way. <laughs> there we go there. Uh, normally I would use a clamshell fairing because they're more realistic, but I couldn't get past the confetti look there. So obviously we have extended our solar panels, we've extended those antennas. And the next thing we want to do, of course, is head up to our apoapsis and make sure we don't fall back into the atmosphere. Uh, that would be quite bad. So, uh, oh, I overshot that uh, apoapsis there a little bit. No matter, we will extend our periapsis there just a little, just to make sure that we stay above the atmosphere. Then we're going to extend our apoapsis way out after that. So yes, our periapsis there now at 80 kilometers so we don't fall back into the atmosphere. We will come down here, turn prograde obviously, do a burn to bring our apoapsis right up there to meet the orbit lines there of the asteroid redirector. And another beautiful shot there as Kerbin falls away. 
Now, if you would like to get a shot like this, use the free camera mode. It's really cool what you can do with it. Now, once we get up here, what we're going to do is a prograde burn again to raise our periapsis just until we can get those pink intercept markers lined up there. So there we go, we can see those pink intercept markers coming together. Now as we get close there, you can of course switch on your RCS and just do a very fine correction. Now we are just going to make another correction here to just fine tune that inclination just a little more. That's going to give us a very, very close intercept. So there we go there, we have a distance of around six kilometers. That's pretty good. We will just time warp around here now so that we can start to do our correction burn wipe off the target velocity as we approach our asteroid redirector and the asteroid itself of course. So our target velocity difference is around 125 meters per second so not a huge burn here. We do need to be fairly careful though because the amount of fuel in our tank is pretty much exactly what we need. We actually also do need to re-intercept with the asteroid a second time. That's simply because we are going to dive the asteroid back down into Kerbin's atmosphere. And we can't do that with the vessel we have here. Just a slight burn towards the target there of 25 meters per second. And as we come in here to meet our asteroid, <laughs> for some reason it does some weird, uh, weird rotation there. I don't know why it did that. So yes, what we're going to do here now is use our asteroid redirector to push the asteroid's periapsis right down so that it's just shy of entering Kerbin's atmosphere. Slowly but surely, we'll just bring this thing around, fighting it to, uh, to turn retrograde. And we're going to slowly start our burn. We're going to lower that periapsis right down. Now, when you are pushing an asteroid, uh, you do have to be quite patient. Uh, we have a lot of nerve rocket motors here. We have some Werner engines uh, on the sides of this thing uh, to try to keep us pointed in the right direction, but it's not always enough. You can't just go flogging the, uh, the engines as hard as possible. Otherwise, you will quite often spin the asteroid out. So you do have to be patient as you uh, maneuver these things. So after a few minutes of a very slow burn, we have the asteroid right down to a 100 kilometer periapsis. After switching back to our asteroid lander vessel, we need to now wipe off that relative target velocity over 280 meters per second. And now of course we'll just do a very small burn towards the target and we'll slowly catch back up on it. Now obviously we could have been more efficient with this stage to not come all the way up and then drop all the way back down. But it is much easier to do an intercept and to re-encounter it a second time than it is to try to encounter it on its way in on such an elliptic orbit. So this is actually an easy way to do it even if it's a little more wasteful in terms of fuel. We could have saved ourselves at least 300 odd meters per second there. As we re-approach and fly by the asteroid, we'll ditch that empty tank and we'll engage the engines on top of our vessel here, which just give us a little maneuvering power. We don't have a lot of fuel, but enough to just make some very small corrections. We will now leave our asteroid redirector in this very elliptical orbit, and it's finally time to allow Asterisk Kerman to leave this little tin box that she's been stuck in for quite a number of years now and she can head now over into our asteroid lander vessel. So she should be quite comfortable sitting up on this little seat there, right? I think so, she's happy. Okay, let's, uh, let's head in and dock this thing to the asteroid. We have our four claw units at the bottom of this thing. Every now and then you will get lucky and get multiple claws to actually connect at the same time, but uh, generally you'll only end up with one connected. Really, the reason I put four on is just because I like the look of them. I think they look really cool. There we go, coming in. And there we go, captured there. So we have hold of this thing. And interestingly enough, we just ended up slightly out of whack there with our inclination. We'll just use our asteroid lander vessel here to slightly adjust this to bring us back in along the elliptical plane. Now this asteroid lander vessel is actually set up to pull the asteroid rather than push it like our asteroid redirector was. 
Um, now, we can't do a lot with this, obviously, because these are only very small engines, but it is enough for us to wipe off a few meters per second to do these few corrections. Now, we just need to now turn retrograde and uh, just bring our periapsis down so that we're going to make a pass through the atmosphere. So for this initial pass through the atmosphere, we're going to bring our periapsis down to around 45 kilometers. That's going to wipe a lot of the velocity off that we encounter here, uh, enough to get us into quite a low orbit. As we head towards our periapsis marker, we're going to turn this thing retrograde, of course. We will retract those solar panels, we don't want them getting blasted off, and we're going to extend these four radiators. Now, the radiators do seem to actually pull some of the heat out of the asteroid. Without the radiators here, I was having this thing explode, which is why they are attached. They also do, of course, give the added benefit of cooling down the parts of your vessel that are getting slightly hit by some heat on the way through the atmosphere. We haven't yet bothered to extend our air brakes simply because uh, they pretty much explode instantly uh, as soon as they hit any sort of air resistance at this speed, so we'll keep these for the second pass. I suspect Astra's probably had her eyes closed that entire time. That'd be pretty frightening sitting on a seat passing through the atmosphere like that. For now, we have popped those radiators back in, solar panels back out, and we'll come out now and do another pass. You can see there that that first pass through the atmosphere really did lower that apoapsis quite a bit. What we're going to do here though, just for presentational purposes, is just slightly raise our apoapsis just so that we're back out of the atmosphere. And we'll just jump into the tracking center and time warp until the Kerbal Space Center passes underneath our periapsis there. And also, uh, just so that the light conditions are a little better. We were landing in the dark there as it was a moment ago. So Astra's Kerman now is going to come down for her final pass into the atmosphere. This time we are going to pull out all of these air brakes uh, coming back down here into the atmosphere. Around 44 kilometers is our periapsis. This should be about right. Now, interestingly, because this asteroid is largely empty, we have drilled the crap out of this thing. Um, it is actually quite light and it does uh, exert quite a force in certain directions. So we can actually rotate as we're coming down here, rotate the asteroid and basically help to steer it uh, one way or another. Everything there has remained quite cool in terms of the temperature scale. The radiators there have done a really good job. And, uh, oh, <laughs> we just lost them there. Must have just clipped the atmosphere a bit funny. So you can see how I'm managing to steer this thing. All I'm doing is rotating the asteroid and it just seems to, uh, yeah, pull us one way in particular as we're coming down. So bringing this down in, well, a fairly controlled manner considering I'm bringing in a huge massive asteroid. So there we go, all of our parachutes are now deployed. We can slowly float this thing to the ground. Again, because the uh, the fuel has been mainly drilled out of this thing, uh, it's falling quite slow. The parachute should remain open even after we touch the ground, meaning that we can uh, slowly rotate this whole thing over and touch down gently on the ground. Let's see how this goes. And... Yes, I did not lose a single part. Well, apart from our radiators, I <laughs> did not lose a single part. So it is now time to determine what our magic asteroid is made out of, what makes this thing tick, what is so important about the pink swirly marks there throughout the surface of the asteroid. Astris Kerman, of course, just happy to be home. She wants to get back to base. She's an engineer, not a scientist. She doesn't want to even touch this asteroid anymore. She is going to now hop out of her seat, head back to the Kerbal Space Center. Uh, very quickly, actually, she's going to Forrest Gump this thing. There is no one here to give her a lift, no welcoming party. She's just left here to leg it all the way back to the astronaut complex. So we can now decouple our asteroid lander and we are going to now recover this as well, leaving our asteroid out here for scientific research. We have Ace Kerman here, our scientist. He is going to drive in his little science buggy and finally take a sample of this mysterious asteroid. Over the many months that Astris has had this asteroid attached to her in orbit, there have been a number of interesting readings coming from the primitive instruments on the asteroid redirector. 
Ace opens up the sample claw and slowly reverses in to take the first sample. While Ace is taking that sample, however, a quick congratulations to King Domino III for finding the hidden message in last week's thumbnail. I did make this one particularly difficult, so well done King Domino III and thank you for supplying your thumbnail for the flag. Who will be next to join our flag collection here, I wonder? Thank you for watching, we will sign off today listening to the conversation between Ace and the Kerbal Space Center. Docking port alignment indicator again is our best friend here. Firstly, rolling our vessel until that little orange marker there points straight up on the indicator panel. Using those I, J, K and L keys, we want to try to keep that little yellow marker pointing at where... The